Right, this is part three of Federalist 14, and he is going to argue about six points in Federalist 14. And uh, if you haven't, please watch the first part, because I think one of the important things about this Federalist that I like is that he's challenging the Americans at the time. He says we have to start thinking at the new reality. We can't be stuck in the past. And it reflects what we are doing and what I'm talking about with you, what I'm sharing with you, is that we cannot, okay, we cannot be in a blind veneration of the past in the words of Madison. Because the posterity will be indebted to us if we make the right decision now. In other words, we can't be looking at everything like people have this 400 years. That the nation state is our tribe. We owe our loyalty only to the nation state. And not to humanity at large. To the future of life on this planet at large. It is foolishness to be stuck in this framework of thought which belongs to the last 400 years. Okay, I'll read paragraph 2. The error which limits, limits Republican government to a narrow district has been unfolded and refuted in preceding papers. He said, he says this mistake that they say Republican government will only work in a, he says, narrow sphere, which means a small place, okay, small land area. He says, I've already refuted it in one of the Federalist papers that we've talked about. I've already said why it is a worthless argument that is not correct. Unfolded. And refuted, unfolded means I've talked about it. I've taken a crack at it. I've looked at it and I've told you why it's a bad argument. Then he continues, I remark here only that it seems to owe its rise and prevalence chiefly to the confounding of a republic with a democracy. He says it's an argument that gets people's attention when some of our critics say that a republic is go only good for a small area and not for a larger, it says, no, they are mistaking republic with a direct democracy, with democracy. Okay? It says there's a difference. Ours is based on a republic. When he says they are confounding of a republic with a democracy, means... They're getting it mixed up. They're making a mistake. They are not seeing the difference. And applying to the former, reasonings drawn from the nature of the latter. And they're getting it mistaken. They're saying a republic is the same as democracy. Democracy is the same as republic. It's not true. Why? Because the true this distinction between these forms, the true difference between these forms was also adverted to on a former occasion. He says, we've already talked about the differences between these two. It seems like these critics of ours, these people who criticize us, are not listening to it. It is that in a democracy, the people meet and exercise the government in person. In a democracy, like the Athenian democracy, or some of those old democracies, People show up, let's say, once a week, once every two weeks, once every three days, once every month, in person and vote, okay? In a republic, they assemble and administer it by their representatives and agents. But in a republic, you send a delegate, you, you delegate authority to a person as a representative of you, they go and see what's best for you based on 
your understanding that this person that is your representative is going to be wise, they will cast a vote for you. This way you can carry on with your life, prosper, make your life better, take care of your family, and let a wise person for a limited number of years that's already been set in the Constitution, how many years that would be, they will represent you or they will cast a vote for you that will hopefully be good not only for your situation now but for your future too. Then he says in the last sentence of paragraph 2, a democracy consequently must be confined to a small spot. A republic may be extended over a large region. So he says, we get it. A democracy then, because people have to go, people themselves have to go vote, it's going to be in a small place. It has to be. But if you are living in a republic, then you can choose somebody here as your representative, and that representative can go to the capital city and cast a vote whenever something comes up. He or she is familiar with your situation here, with your surrounding situation, so they can wisely decide on your behalf. So he says, this is the first mistake that we needed to clarify. This wrong perception that our people that criticize us have. And then in the next paragraph says, to this accidental source of the error, may be added the artifice of some celebrated authors whose writings have had a great share in forming the modern standard of political opinions. He says, well, in all fairness, some of these errors that our critics make is because they've been looking at some of these books or some of these thoughts that some philosophers that they are familiar with have had. And we know, we've already said, that Montesquieu is one of the main people that they are thinking about, because they say that great man Montesquieu, who wrote The Spirit of the Laws, he has said that republics got to be small in area and kind of got to be homogeneous in population. Then he continues in the next line, being subjects either of an absolute or limited monarchy, they have endeavored to heighten the advantages or palliate the evils of those forms by placing in comparison with them the vices and defects of the republicans and by citing as specimens of the latter the turbulent democracies of ancient Greece and modern Italy. He says these people, because they are still connected to monarchies or they have studied monarchies that are either absolute or limited, what they have done is they have endeavored to heighten the advantages. In other words, they keep on bragging and exaggerating the advantages that monarchies have and palliate the evils of those forms and make you kind of softly or make you see the awful things that they have as something that you can palliate. Almost you can actually be comfortable with it. You can chew on it. It won't kill you. It's something that's, that is really not harmful. So what they've done is They've got you to believe that all the advantages they have on that side are great and there's not really that many disadvantages. And what they do by placing in comparison with them the vices and defects of the Republican and by citing the specimen, specimens of the latter, the turbulent democracies of ancient Greece and modern Italy. And he says, on the other hand, they turn around and exaggerate on all the bad things that have happened in 
the democracies of Athens and modern Italy. When he says modern Italy, he's talking about the 15th century Italy, 16th century Italy. But, he's, but he says, he uses the word democracy. He says, they are not republics. They are democracies. So when they exaggerate and they tell you, oh, look, these republics had a very bad past. They all died down in chaos and anarchy. Madison here says, no, they were not republics. They were democracies because people would show up in small places and order and, and vote themselves. They did not have representation. Under the confusion of names, it has been an easy task to transfer to a republic observations applicable to a democracy only. So they confuse names, they make mistakes about the title they give to these governments, and as a result, they get you all confused instead of saying that democracies were in chaos and anarchy, they say republics were, which is not true, which is not true. The observations that it can never be established but among a small number of people living within a small compass of ter territory. And they always constantly argue that this should be only, a republic can only be established for a small population in a small territory. And Madison, as he's already said, he says, we are going to prove them wrong. That republics, because of representation, they can be established in large places for large populations. 